So with that little intro, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Josh Feinberg, um, professor at the University of Minnesota and associate director of the Institute for Rock Magnetism, who's going to be telling us about work he's been doing on the paleomagnetism of pseudotacolites, um, starting really in on the, on the fault part of tectonic applications of paleomagnetism. Hey, everybody. Can everybody see the, the presentation slide? Fantastic. Uh, just to start off, I just wanted to say thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk. I very much appreciate it. Uh, everything I'm going to be sharing today is the result of collaboration with a lot of different people, some students and then colleagues at other institutions as well. Most of the data I'm going to be sharing today was collected by one of my ex-students. His name is Max Longchamp. Uh, but then there are also really important contributions from folks like Andrea Biederman, Laurel Goodwin, Brad Singer, and Roger Fruit. Uh, what I'm going to be talking today about are, are pseudotacolites. These are small little uh, surfaces of melt that are generated during brittle rupture events, uh, during earthquakes. And what I'm showing you here on this, this title slide is actually one of the tiny little sort of micro cores that were collected to try and isolate uh, one of these pseudotacolites. And what you can see in that little core, you see those little orientation arrows that you know we all draw some form of on our, our, our core samples. And the little black wafer that's in the middle that's sub-centimeter in scale, that's the pseudotacolite itself. The rock on either side of that is host rock. And hopefully this will give you a sense of, of exactly how difficult it is uh, to sample some of these things. They are incredibly friable kinds of materials. And the ability to actually get a core of one of these things and then shave away the the host rock so you can just get a, a sense of what the recording of the pseudotacolite is, is really challenging. Uh, but first, some basics. So like I mentioned in the introduction, pseudotacolites are forming as melt uh, created due to frictional heating during large slip events. And so these are typically thought to form during magnitude 5.5 and larger kinds of, of earthquakes. The important thing for paleomagnetism is that they're actually crystallizing new magnetite within that little glassy slip across the fault surface. And so they're melting and quenching all within a time span of only seconds to minutes. These are not long, slow cooling kinds of events. These are really rapid uh, events that happen and any reporting that's gonna be preserved by the pseudotacolite is gonna be locked in literally on the order of seconds to minutes. Uh, so it's really quite amazing. I'm showing you a photograph here uh, with a centimeter scale there to show you know, what this looks like on a, a freshly cut surface. And you can see that there's a, a pseudotacolite vein that's sort of moving from left to right across the, the image that's there. That's the, the fault surface itself. There are another kind of pseudotacolite feature called injection veins, where some of that melt is actually forcibly injected into the surrounding host rock, usually for igneous intrusive rocks along any sort of pre-existing mineral fabrics. Uh, so if there are SC fabrics, for example, some of that uh, melt can actually be forcibly injected along those, those boundaries there. But for the purposes of this study, we were examining bits of the pseudotacolates that were forming primarily along the fault surface itself, not along the injection veins. So the goal of this project uh, is we're looking at pseudotacolites that form on what are called low angle normal faults, or faults that are existing at relatively low angles in the modern day as we sample them. And one of the, the big debates here is that uh, within the structural geology community and tectonics community, there is debate over whether or not these low angle normal faults formed in their current orientation, or if they formed at a steeper angle and then rotated to a shallower one. Um, my hope here is that we can try and use the remnants that's actually recorded by these pseudotacolites combined with information about the age of the pseudotacolite and the apparent polar wonder path from North America to try and figure out if they ruptured in place or if they ruptured at a different angle and then were rotated to their current orientation. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the controversy around pseudotacolites. Uh, there's something called Andersonian fault mechanics that predicts that when rocks are going to uh, fail by extension, that they should form at relatively steep angles. Uh, so we're looking at around, around 60 degrees or so. Normal faults uh, dip at, that are dipping at less than 30 degrees are considered to be low angle normal faults. Um, and that's a little bit unusual. A 
mechanics folks have a hard time explaining why you could actually have a normal fault that would be at angles less than about 30 degrees. Uh, mechanically, it just doesn't make too much sense. One of the things that, uh, one of the alternative explanations that was created by uh, Wernicke back in the early 90s was that the low angle normal faults that we see today in the field were actually regular normal faults that ruptured at higher angles and then through isostatic uplift were progressively rotated into their current low angle orientation. And the sort of schematic is, is shown here in the bottom right that's there. And the reason that this is important to try and understand is there's lots of low angle normal faults all around the world and they're not currently considered to be seismic hazards. But if it is shown that low angle normal faults can actually rupture in their low angle orientation, then that opens up a whole new range of seismic hazards and sort of public health hazards that need to be considered as communities continue to grow and expand into all different kinds of places. So that's the sort of why bother kind of motivation for the study. If these are forming at low angles, that's an important detail we need to know for our communities. So my group is, is exploring this question at a specific field area in Arizona. It's a place called the South Mountains Metamorphic Core Complex. And the pseudotacolites are thought to have formed in ultramyelinite during this sort of metamor metamorphic core complex exhumation. So the general idea here is in this diagram uh, that you had the overlying uh, roof sliding away towards the sort of south southwest and exposing progressively older rocks as you went down. We're going to be looking at a place called the northeast site, which is literally at the sort of northeast furthest most extension of, of this overall complex. And at that site, uh, the, the veins that we're looking at there, the sort of pseudotacolite veins, range in thickness from around three and a half to 15 millimeters in scale, with an average thickness of around seven millimeters. And the, the pseudotacolite veins themselves are planar features. And on average, they're striking at about 220 degrees, dipping 14 degrees, following the right hand rule. So a little bit before I show you the field site and you know what these things look like and how they're behaving magnetically, let me just tell you a little bit about what we know geochronologically about this area. Uh, so the, the rocks where these pseudotacolites are formed are, are granodiorites that have been ultramyelinitized. Um, and there's been an emplacement age of 22 million years that was determined way back in, in 1986. What's interesting about these rocks is that they were thought to be cooling rapidly during their overall exhumation as part of this metamorphic core complex. And there's a, a cooling path history that's actually shown in the figure on the right. This was compiled by Dana Smith, who was a master's student with Laurel Goodwin at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she compiled all of this data to try and show what the thermochronologic history of the area was. And you can see that the, the cooling uh, history was relatively rapid. Uh, after the time of formation, there's a series of different geothermal chronometers that are used, hornblend, biotites, apatites, that actually allow you to tell when the rock passed through certain temperature regimes in time. Uh, so it's only once a rock is able to get below temperatures of around 400 degrees centigrade that it can start to behave brittily. And that's a uh, you know, necessary condition for the formation of these pseudotacolites. Uh, more recently, in working with Brad Singer, also at the University of, of Wisconsin-Madison, we used a technique uh, called ultraviolet laser ablation uh, microprobe, or UV lamp, that allowed us to actually go in and focus a laser directly on the glassy portions that are still preserved within the pseudotacolite to collect step heating uh, argon-argon ages of the pseudotacolite itself. So we're not just dating the host rock anymore and its cooling history, but we're actually dating the precise age of the pseudotacolite. And when we did that, we got a range of ages from around 18.9 to 16.2 million years in age. And what was really interesting is that at this Northeast site, which is really only an exposure of around 10 meters by 10 meters, we found five different distinctly aged pseudotacolite ages uh, in various samples. And what that means is we're actually able to estimate a recurrence rate for when these pseudotacolites formed of around half a million years, which is interesting. But it's also worth mentioning, uh, you know, initially when I started the fieldwork on this project, I thought all the pseudotacolites at this site were from a single rupture event. But it actually turns out, and we can show this 
using argon argon geochronology and paleomagnetism, as I'll show in just a little bit, that there were actually multiple generations of pseudotacolite that are being preserved at this site. Uh, there's the geomagnetic polarity time scale across the top of this figure. So you can actually see that while this exhumation history was occurring and while the pseudotacolites were forming, the Earth's magnetic field was in the process of reversing back and forth. Okay, so what does this field site actually look like in Arizona? This is an example uh, of just sort of one of the outcrop exposures. For context, this is not a high point on a hill or anything like that. This is actually uh, midway down a hill and the exposure has been created because there was a, a company that was installing a large parking lot basically. So all of the overburden had been conveniently removed. We were able to get a nice fresh exposure of the rock, which was great. And so we were able to go around and, and map where the, the various pseudotacolites were. And the, they're being shown sort of in the, the white dashed line areas, the blue box on the left is where I'm gonna zoom into next. And here uh, with a pen for scale, you can actually see what one of these pseudotacolites looks like and see that they sort of have a, a black dark appearance there. They are occurring within the sort of ultra myelinitized uh, granodiorite zone uh, within the host rock there. And sampling these is really, really challenging. Uh, they, they desperately want to break and fracture into a million small pieces. And so actually getting a, a sample where you can actually you know, drill out a core is, is very, very difficult. Uh, that was probably what we spent the vast majority of our time on this project doing was just trying to get well-oriented core samples out of this rock. Uh, we took some block samples, we drilled some on site, um, and, and they were the focus of study for both Dana Smith at the University of Wisconsin, as well as Max Longchamp at the IRM. So there's kind of a testable hypothesis here for this site in Arizona. If the fault ruptured in its current low angle orientation, then we would expect all of the directions from the pseudotacolite to be well clustered. And they should actually be occurring right around the direction that we would expect the field to be at the time that the pseudotacolites formed, which was sometime between 18.8 and 16.2 million years ago. If we look at the North American apparent polar wander path, uh, we can go and we can find what we expect the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at this location to be. This is basically using the apparent polar wander path of uh, Bess and Cortillo, I think back in 2002. Um, and then from that direction, we're applying a, an error ellipse of 15 degrees to accommodate the very likely secular variation that was occurring at the time as well. And so that, that star along with its circle is sort of representing what we think the target field should have been for this site in Arizona uh, back when the pseudotacolites were actually forming. And so as a testable hypothesis, if they're all clustering around that direction, that would mean that they probably formed a in their current orientation, in their current configuration, or the alternative, that sort of Brian Wernicke model is, if the fault was rotated from a steeper dip to its current low angle orientation along a sort of rolling hinge, then we would expect those directions to trace out uh, towards the sort of northeast there of that stereo net, uh, depending on how much rotation had actually occurred in some way. It would be a small circle path that was actually being traced out. So these are the sort of two testable models that we, we had for our pseudotacolites when we went out there to, to try and do this work. So oh, let me move forward there. I think some of my slides are out of order. Let's, uh, before we actually get to the results, I just want to talk about some of the demagnetization behavior and what the, the samples actually look like there. Uh, these are examples of both alternating field and thermal demagnetization uh, results that we have. These are basically showing that uh, in some instances we have a univectorial decay towards the origin, while in others there seem to be multiple components that are present there. Much of the remnants in our samples is removed after just 15 millitesla alternating field treatments. Um, I'm going to explain what the, the red and the blue components are a little bit later on in the talk. There's a pretty well-pronounced anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility in these rocks. In instances where we're able to you know, isolate just the host and just the pseudotacolite, 
we actually found somewhat similar results. And I think this is in part a, a representation of the more ductile deformation that occurred first to form the ultramyelinite zone. And then the pseudotacolate was occurring within that existing fabric, experiencing much of the same stresses. So it produced a, an AMS that is very, very similar to that of the, the host. Uh, the dashed line that you can see in the stereo net on the right is the orientation of the, the planes of the pseudotacolates that typically formed at this northeast site. And you can see that most of the, the K1 directions are oriented such that they are, are parallel to the, the strike directions, uh, which is interesting. And so the, the arrows that are being shown in the left-hand side, that's the direction of sort of metamorphic core complex movement throughout this whole thing as well. So we're, we're getting a sense that the AMS is reflecting the larger mineral fabric of the rock itself. AMS is not carried by the grains that are holding the remnants. So if we want to get a sense of how anisotropic the remnants carriers are in these rocks, then we need to use tools like the anisotropy of anhistoretic remnant magnetization. And so the anisotropy of ARM results are, are shown here as well. Directionally, they're very similar to the AMS, but it's worth showing you a little bit about the, the shape and intensity of the anisotropy within these rocks. Uh, so in these plots here, what I'm showing is the degree of anisotropy on the, the x-axis. So the further you go to the right, the more anisotropic each sample is. And the, the U parameter on the, the, the y-axis there is actually telling you if it's, if it's oblate. So positive values are going to be oblate fabrics, and negative values are going to be prolate fabrics. And there's a, a little reference gray field that you're seeing uh, in all of these plots as well. That's a series of basalt samples that were measured by Andrea Biederman. Uh, and they're just meant to sort of show the range of sort of typical basalt samples uh, and, and the behaviors that they express in general uh, for, for AARM. And each one of these different figures that you're seeing is for a different coercivity window within our samples. And so if we just look at the grains that have coercivities between 0 to 15 millitesla, the, the anisotropy of, of those grains is shown in that plot on the left. And we can see that uh, the black points are the host, the little red diamonds are the pseudotacolite, and you're getting some pretty extreme uh, degrees of anisotropy there, you know, p values in between around two and three on average, and everything is, is prolate. And then as you move to higher coercivity windows, either 15 to 30 or 30 and higher, one of the things that you start to see is that degree of anisotropy starts to move towards lower and lower values. It's becoming less anisotropic as you move to higher coercivities. And uh, it, it's becoming slightly more oblate as well. Uh, and so this is, this is important for trying to understand which magnetic mineral carriers in the pseudotacolites are going to be the most uh, robust recorders of the, the Earth's magnetic field. It's not going to be the, the lowest coercivity ones because they're showing the, the highest extreme anisotropy, it's going to be the higher coercivity ones that have those lower p-values uh, that are there. If we just take one of the pseudotacolite samples and apply an ARM to it, one of the things that we notice right off the bat is that the ARM is deflected pretty strongly. And so what I'm showing in A and B is just a, an ARM that was given straight down, uh, you know, straight down, literally. It should be right in the middle of that stereo net. And the fact that it's offset a little higher upwards is an indication of this extreme remnant anisotropy in these pseudotacolates. They are very anisotropic. And you can see this in the uh, vector endpoint diagram as well. That data should be right along the, the vertical axis there, and it's displaced off to the left. Andrea Biederman, uh, a former postdoc at the IRM, who's now in Switzerland at the University of Bern, came up with this really nice, elegant, and sophisticated model to use those different coercivity windows to correct the remnants uh, in highly anisotropic rocks. And when we apply her method, then we get a, a corrected demagnetization path that's shown in C and D. And so this, this slide is just meant to show that for these rocks, this correction tends to work pretty well. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And so if we have a, a suite of samples, a suite of pseudotacolite samples uh, that we give an an ARM in the lab, we might get a distribution like what you see on the left. And when we apply Andrea's anisotropy correction, then we actually get a tighter grouping and a more accurate grouping because we know the direction here. 
um, the inclination is 87 rather than 84. And the alpha 95 has gone down a little bit. So it's a really nice correction method that I would encourage all of everybody to, to take a look at. It's Biederman 2018 in EPSL. When we apply that correction to the NRM directions uh, for those samples that were AFD magnetized, uh, what we see is we, we start to take, we start to steepen the, the demagnetization paths of the pseudotacolytes themselves. So the uncorrected uh, demagnetization path is shown in C, and the corrected demagnetization path is shown in D. And you can see that it's a little bit steeper in those cases there. So this is one way that we're hoping to see through some of this extreme anisotropy inside these pseudotacolytes and get it a, a more a closer version of what the field was like when these pseudotacolytes actually formed. Here's another example of a, a corrected NRM direction. Um, so again, you're seeing the moment on the left, the stereonet in, the, in B, the uncorrected version in C, and the corrected version in D. And what's important and that I want to draw your attention to is uh, many of our samples, this is not an uncommon thing, showed two overlapping coercivity distributions. So you can see two components very, very clearly in both C and D. Um, if we just look at D for a moment, the component that goes from zero millitesla to 15 is a relatively linear, well, curvilinear uh, component. And then there's a very sharp elbow and then uh, it moves closer towards the origin at, at higher coercivities. And that's gonna become important a little bit later on. Um, so again, if, if we wanted to get a, a better reading of the field, we'd wanna use higher coercivity uh, grains to try and do this. One of the concerns uh, around pseudotacolytes uh, is the possibility of something called earthquake lightning. And uh, this is something that was studied uh, in the early 2000s by Eric Ferre, who's done a lot of really great work on pseudotacolytes. And the idea is that there's a buildup of some sort of static charge that may actually be discharged during a rupture event and actually create an isolated IRM uh, along the plane of the pseudotacolyte. And so the concern was, are some of the, the remnant magnetizations that we're seeing in these pseudotacolytes you know, a reflection of a, a short-lived you know, static discharge, especially an IRM, or are they something that's more akin to what we would expect the Earth's magnetic field to look like? And to try and to sort of get some sense of, of what we were looking at, what I'm plotting here is a histogram, a series of histograms, actually. The gray histogram is showing you the range of the NRM intensities for the pseudotacolytes themselves. And this is a log plot. And you can see that we're looking around 10 to the minus four amp meter squared per kilogram. If we were to give fully demagnetized pseudotacolyte samples a 50 microtesla ARM, we get a distribution that is on the same order of magnitude, which is a useful point of comparison. If we were to give them a very small IRM, of just 10 millitesla, we actually see that the intensity of magnetization increases by two orders of magnitude, roughly. Um, and so from this, we lean towards saying it is, it's unlikely that the remnants recorded by these pseudotacolytes is an IRM or anything related to some sort of static discharge, uh, or if it was, the static discharge was very, very, very weak. Um, so this is just a little bit of context for, for that argument. When we look at the grains that are inside uh, these pseudotacolytes, we see that there's, there's two populations of them. Uh, there's magnetite from the, the host rock. These are images from an electron microscope here, at, microprobe here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, there's a, a host rock image shown in, uh, in panel C here. And you can see that the, the edges of the grains are, are not euhedral at all. They're sort of, uh, well, they're a little bit chewed up, uh, for lack of a better description. There's a small zircon crystal that's over in the upper left-hand side of that image there. You can see that there are fracture planes within, the, uh, within that magnetite as well, where there's incipient oxidation or partial oxidation of the magnetite itself. Um, so that's, that's an example of what the grains look like in the host rock, not even the pseudotacolite. Uh, but within the pseudotacolytes themselves, there are examples of some of those host rock grains that have been ground up. And D in this image here is an example of one of those. It's relatively large, you know, it's 
tens of microns in length. Um, we can actually see those same sort of planes of a fracture and partial oxidation that are occurring that we see in the host rock samples as well. And there's even zircon and in some cases, apatite uh, grains that are included as well, which again, matches what we see in the host rock samples. The, the two images on the far right are, are actually showing you images of, of magnetite grains that formed and crystallized in the glassy melt of the pseudotacolite itself. And they're fundamentally different from the host rock samples. They're much smaller and their edges are much more euhedral than that of the host rock samples. They're still you know, large by most uh, standards here, but there's a grain size distribution that goes down to much, much finer grain sizes as we go. Uh, but this two different population of, of grains is important and we'll see it represented in rock magnetic data as well as remnants data as we go forward. This is an image uh, again of the pseudotacolites just stepping back a little bit. The contrast is set up here so you can see the oxides jumping out at you and you can see that sometimes there are these um, host grains that have been incorporated into the pseudotacolite and just ground down into a whole lot of smaller pieces. And they sort of form these chain of uh, decommunuted grains uh, throughout the, the pseudotacolate itself. And so this in part helps explain some of the extreme anisotropy that we're seeing. There's this incredible sort of spatial anisotropy of those host rock grains. The grains that formed in the pseudotacolate melt are not like that. They're actually distributed somewhat evenly throughout the matrix of the pseudotacolite. And that helps explain why the anisotropy of ARM results got less anisotropic for the higher coercivity grains uh, because they're more evenly distributed in the glass around the pseudotacolite. Uh, one of the things we like to do at the IRM is we like to look at the low temperature magnetic properties of, of many of our samples. These are uh, what are called FC and ZFC curves for uh, or field-cooled and zero field-cooled data sets for some of our samples. So what's happening here is we're taking a, a sample and we are cooling it in the presence of a two and a half Tesla field from room temperature down to 10 degrees Kelvin. And then for the field-cooled remnants, uh, we'll then turn off the field at 10 degrees and then measure that field as we warm back up to room temperature. For zero field remnants, we're cooling down in a zero field environment, giving it a two and a half Tesla IRM at 10 degrees and then turning it off and then measuring on warming again. And so the point here is if you look at the host rock sample, the one on the left, we see a classic Verwe transition. We see really a, a signature for what looks like traditional magnetite, where at low temperatures, the magnetite is existing as a monoclinic form. It passes through the Verwe transition to become cubic. And in doing that, it loses a lot of remnants. Uh, that had been previously held. And so that, that step that we see at around 120 degrees, that's classic magnetite behavior. Uh, if you look at the pseudotacolite sample, it's really quite different. Uh, there's, there's two subtle kinks that are there. And what we're seeing is that the first initial drop in magnetization that we're measuring on warming happens at a much lower temperature than we saw in the host rock. But then as we continue to warm, there's another second drop that coincides with the temperature that we saw in the, the host sample that are here. So what the way that we're interpreting this right now is that these two different populations of grains each have subtly different expressions of the Verwey transition. Those grains that nucleated and grew within seconds of the, the rupture event probably have lots of strain in them as well, and there's some degree of disorder. And so we think that's why the it requires a lower temperature for that uh, Verwey transition to actually be expressed. We see differences between the host rock and the pseudotacolite and fork diagrams. Uh, the fork diagram on the left shows a you know, population there of largely uh, vortex style grains. Uh, I'm trying not to use the bad word of, of pseudo single domain uh, that's there. If we compare that fork diagram to one of the, the pseudotacolite, we see that there is still much of that same signature uh, right around the origin but that there's this higher coercivity tail that extends out further uh, along the sort of um, BU equals zero axis along the ridge that's there. There's a higher coercivity component that is present within the pseudotacolite. And we think that that's those very fine grain uh, magnetites that were formed within the pseudotacolite glass itself, the ones that have the lower Verwey transition temperature. 
when we do coercivity unmixing, we see a similar story here as well. If we do coercivity unmixing for the host rock, shown in A, we get a nice log normal distribution that can be fit with a single component. If we do the same thing for a pseudotacolite sample, we actually need two components to fit that uh, with some degree of confidence. And if we take the, the median BH value for those log normal distributions and compare and then also plot them by their dispersion parameter, which is the sort of full width half maximum value, and create a biplot of those two parameters, we can see that the host sample is shown with those red dots and has its coercivities ranging between around a little bit less than 20 up to about 40 millitesla and dispersion parameters between around 2.7 to, to 3.2. And then the pseudotacolite samples seem to have that same component, the inherited grains, but then they also have a much higher coercivity component. And that's those, the new, newly nucleated grains that are present. Uh, just, uh, just two more minutes. Oh, crikey, crikey. All right, I'm going too long. So let me zip back to the, the, the final story here. Um, here, is, here are the results of where the directions are. The reference direction is the star and the sort of error ellipse is shown there. We find remnant directions of both polarities that do overlap with the, the, rem, the, rem, the expected remnant direction that is there. The error is large because these are non-perfect paleomagnetic recorders that are highly anisotropic, but we're finding them in both polarities and they do pass a reversal test. Um, so let me scroll way back down here because I was a little bit out of order. Thanks for that heads up, Nick. Very deeply appreciated. Uh, we can image these rocks as well and, and using a QDM at, the, at Harvard University with Roger, we can actually see where the remnants is, is held. And in this particular instance, the remnants is held within the pseudotacolate vein itself, but we also see that there's these low coercivity, large host grains that are there also. Um, and we can start to demagnetize those samples and remove their magnetization from the images too. Uh, so this was just a comparison of QDM results for some of our pseudotacolites and what we're seeing. So just to try and stay on schedule here, veins of pseudotacolite in Arizona seem to have ruptured in place and have not been appre appreciably rotated since their formation. We think they actually ruptured in their current low angle configuration, which has important implications for public safety and around low angle normal faults. Some of these things are normal, some of them are reversed. They were all collected within 10 meters of one another and yet they passed the reversal test, which is really incredible uh, to think about. These things are really anisotropic and even a, a pretty sophisticated correction technique only partially corrects their, their remnants anisotropy. Um, a close look at where those remnants directions were falling shows that they're actually being pulled towards the plane of the pseudotacolate itself and we couldn't quite get rid of that effect. Um, there's definitely two generations of magnetite there and the interpretation of the remnants requires that you look only at the remnants held by those really fine grains that were nucleated and grown within the glassy portions of the pseudotacolite itself. Thanks, and sorry for running over. Great, thanks, thanks, Josh. Um, and we have five. We have five minutes for uh, for questions here for for Josh. And I think you can just feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand um, or type it in the in the chat. Um, I guess I'll start with a, a, a quick one. I'm just, yeah, I'm curious, you sort of describe, you know, how quickly these glasses are, are quenched. Um, and this might just be a question belaying my own ignorance, but are, are there ways to sort of infer crystallization cooling timescale from the size of those largest skeletal magnetite grains? Um, those, you know, getting up to a couple microns? There probably is. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Um, you could do a sort of crystal size distribution exercise, um, you know, people where you actually look at the, the distribution of sizes that were there and, and try and back out what the crystallization history might be. Um, that's something we haven't looked into, but it's a really good idea. That would be interesting to do. But we do know from thermal modeling that this quen the quenching of these things is, is near instantaneous on the order of seconds to minutes for sure. Great. We have a question from Kawe, if you want to just un unmute and go for it. Hey, Josh, great talk. Um, sorry if I missed that. Can you talk a little bit about simple preparation? So are you cutting the veins and are you are you tackling specific parts? Oh, no, it's a great question. Um, and I didn't go into it in too much detail. So thanks for asking. Um, 
like I mentioned, these things are really hard to sample. Uh, they're very friable. They want to break apart in many ways. And so we had to, to try and find areas that we could collect small, uh, either cylindrical cores through or that we could cut small uh, sort of tabular samples and then carefully remove as much of the, the host rock as we possibly could all, while maintaining their, their orientation. Um, so we had 40 samples, and then each of those samples was subdivided into a minimum of five other you know, specimens. Um, and like I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, the vast majority of this project was just sample prep. It was, it was agonizing. Um, Max Longchamp broke more drill bits than we ever have before at the IRM, just trying to prepare these things as carefully as possible. Um, and so, yeah. That's, that's where we're at. We have a question from Jeff B. Yeah. Hey, great talk. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering if you have looked at the directions in the host rock. I mean, the foot wall, does it show the same lack of rotation? Uh, so, yes, it does. And there was a, a study that was done by you know, good old John Geisman and his, one of his students, uh, Levikari, that uh, looked at the, the host rocks a long time ago. And they're not really great paleomagnetic recorders. You know, they have a lot of multi-domain magnetite in them, but to the best of their ability, they suggested that uh, it looked like they had not rotated either. Uh, the problem was from the, the tectonicists and, and the sort of structural geologists with that study was, well, you're not really dating the age of the, the rupture event itself. So it, 